COVID-19 cases are once again on the rise across Europe and the United States could be next. Hello, I'm Arlen Nido and this is The Heat. Just as the world is beginning to let down its guard and reduce COVID-19 restrictions, there's new concern about future waves of the virus. Scientists are tracking several new Omicron subvariants. Already 15 countries across Europe, including France and Germany, are reporting an increase in infections. Earlier, I spoke with Dr. Margaret Harris, the spokesperson for the World Health Organization. Dr. Harris, thanks for joining us. In September, the Director General of the WHO, uh, Tedros Ghebreyesus, was very optimistic about the end of the pandemic. He says the world has never been in a better position to bring this COVID-19 pandemic to an end. Um, why does the WHO believe that the end is now in sight? Good to be with you, Anand. Well, it's important to clarify what he really said, and that's, yes, the end is in sight, but we are not there yet. And he further clarified the next week by saying, given that indeed those words were grabbed on by the world, or the world is desperate to see the end, uh, he clarified it by saying, just because you can see it doesn't mean you're there. It actually means you have to do a lot of very hard work to reach it. Now, epidemiologically, the numbers are coming down in most parts of the world. But unfortunately, here in Europe, we have seen a rise in cases. We've seen a rise in cases in Germany and France. And we've still seen 9,000 people dying each week. That's an extraordinary number of people to lose their lives. So we've still got a lot of work to do. You clarified that. The end is in sight, but we're not there yet. I mean, is there a risk that in many parts of the world, uh, we may be dropping our guard too soon. There's a big risk of that. And in, in fact, that's really what Dr. Tedros was trying to get across. You know, like, we're getting there, guys. We're doing the right things, but we have to do more of them. Now, what was concerning us is that in many countries, the ability to detect this virus, the surveillance system, the laboratories, the testing has been dismantled or at least reduced. We're not seeing nearly the number of sequences in, or in order to track potential variants. And with the Omicron variant that we've de been dealing with since November last year has now got something like nearly 100 different children, different lineages that we really need to be watching to be sure that we're on top of what's going on with this virus. Dr. Harris, the Lancet COVID-19 Commission, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with the report that they've just produced, they are an independent panel of experts that investigated the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that report was, was critical of the WHO. It said the WHO acted too cautiously and too slowly, which enabled the virus to spread. Um, what is the WHO's response to that criticism? Were mistakes made? We've looked at this report and they've got some very important and valuable insights, particularly they've focused on the failure of the world to work together. Now, no, WHO was not too slow. As soon as we were informed, in fact, we let the world know. And we convened our first emergency committee under the international health regulations really in record time, within three weeks of learning that there was this potential threat. The first meeting, the emergency committee that's independent experts actually advised WHO that it was not an emergency. And they said, we'll meet again in 10 days. Now, those days weren't lost. Dr. Tedros and the most senior leaders in emergencies went to China, met with President Xi Jinping, looked at what was going on. And when they returned to Geneva, immediately recalled the emergency committee, who then did advise that it was indeed a public health emergency of international concern. And that was in January. 2020. Now, uh, that kind of delay, was that, has that been rectified? So I think I should focus again on delay. Now, where the delay really was, was uh, when WHO said there's an emergency, the world didn't listen. Now, some countries did. 
some countries acted. They acted on the recommendations that were made when we raised that highest level of alarm. But a lot of countries were still saying, oh, it's just a cold, and were not taking the actions. It wasn't until the virus had spread all around the world and was transmitting so widely that we said it is now characterized as a pandemic. That seemed to be the word that woke up the world. But that was indeed too late for the world to react. Looking at some numbers that was uh, produced by Johns Hopkins University here in the United States, Johns Hopkins says 6.5 million people worldwide have died from COVID-19. More than a million of those people died right here in the United States. Uh, looking back, I mean, what were the mistakes that the U.S. made? Well, we don't really single out countries, but what happened in many countries was there did not seem to be early on um, a recognition of how dangerous this virus is and a recognition of the level of illness people would suffer that if you had large numbers of cases, it was simply a numbers game. If you let the virus transmit in your community, you would then have, even if it was only 10% of people who got sick, that would rapidly overwhelm your health system. And that meant many people who couldn't get treatment were also likely to die. So that would raise your death rate. And we've sadly seen this in many, many countries over and over. And the really strong message for all countries, and we have seen enormous loss. I don't know anybody who hasn't lost somebody in this pandemic. The real lesson is get your health system to a strong level, and by strong I mean a level where every person in your population can get good basic health care, can get to a doctor, can get to a hospital, can get the right safe medicines when they need it. What is your assessment of the program that was put in place right at the outbreak to raise public awareness of what the pandemic was, was about, uh, how fast it was spreading, and the measures that could be taken to counter the spread of the virus? Certainly. Right from the beginning, again, we used very much public health communication that has been very much my job. Uh, and we had daily press conferences, in fact, to inform the public. We also asked our experts to go into all kinds of social media, to do things like social lives and listen to the questions of the people and understand what was going, what they were thinking to help people understand better that this was a very serious matter and to give them autonomy, to give them the ability to make the right decisions to protect their health. Right. Now, the WHO, of course, is looking ahead. Dr. Gabrielsis is proposing what he describes as a game changer, a project that will entail sweeping changes uh, to global health infrastructure. It will ensure, and uh, I'm quoting here, scientific and political cooperation across borders before, during and after an outbreak. What can you tell us about this initiative? So right now, we've got a lot of initiatives. We already started something called the Berlin Hub, which is a hub for being looking ahead to try to understand any signal that's out there and see what it's likely to do. But we're also leading and coordinating an international technical consultation to reach a consensus uh, with global issues on what we can all as a world do uh, to be really prepared, and not just prepared, but the minute we understand a true emergency is there, work together. This is what failed this time, but we, 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 sh we can't keep on doing this. It's mm -hmm. been described as a cycle of panic and neglect. When we don't have a large emergency on, people sort of seem to go back right back to normal. But preparedness is critical for for, for, for saving lives and preventing this kind of pandemic. It's a bit like housewife work, work. You don't notice it unless it's not being done. And when it's not being done, things are really, really bad. Preparedness is absolutely key. So we've got this international ne negotiating body working right now, and we're taking a lot of submissions right now to look at how can the world really genuinely get together when there's an emergency on and do what needs to be done. The U.S. President, uh, Joe Biden, he recently declared the pandemic over, and it looks like much of the world is ready to move on from this pandemic. But are there still basic precautions that should still be in place? Certainly, 
it's, uh, the US and Europe are going into winter. And when every year when you go into winter, seasonal respiratory viruses turn up. Now, we haven't we haven't got rid of COVID. As we said, the end is in sight, but we're not there yet. And we are seeing an uptick. And we've, there's a lot of transmission still going on in the US, and we're certainly seeing big upticks in Europe. So when you've got COVID circulating and other respiratory viruses, particularly influenza, you are at high risk. So what do you do? There are things that work. Wearing masks in crowded spaces, ensuring that you can ventilate your spaces, even though it's cold, but open that window and let the air ventilate through. Don't overcrowd in your schools and your offices. Don't crowd people back in like the bad old days. Make your space a healthy space. And of course, look to vaccination. If, if, you've, if you're in the high risk groups and you're advised by your health, um, health advisor or your health authorities to get vaccinated, get that COVID vaccine, get that COVID booster, but also get your influenza vaccine as soon as you can. Dr. Harris, thanks for joining us. For more now on COVID-19 and expectations for the coming months, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from San Francisco is Dr. Alok Patel. He's a pediatric hospitalist and medical journalist. Also with us from California is Dr. Roger Schwelt. He's a pulmonary and critical care physician and co-founder of Medcram an online platform for medical videos. And Dr. Chris Smith is a consultant virologist at the University of Cambridge and presenter of the Naked Scientists podcast in the United Kingdom. Thank you everyone for being with us. Chris, let me start with you. Uh, we are getting these reports of these new sub-variants that are sweeping across Europe and the United States and they could be pushing up cases uh, in these regions, uh, especially as we get into the winter or at least first the autumn and then the winter months. And a virologist, James Young, actually told the Independent newspaper in the United Kingdom that the downscaling of testing laboratories in the United Kingdom is effectively uh, leaving the United Kingdom blind to these new variants. Um, what is the situation there? And are you expecting to see a significant increase in the number of infections? We already have seen a very big increase. The hospital that I helped to run the diagnostic lab in currently has now 90 cases of coronavirus and that's a tripling in a relatively short space of time and we're just one hospital there are hundreds so we're certainly seeing an uptick in in cases coming through what's reassuring though is that the severity of illness does remain reliably and reassuringly low so what we attribute that to is that while we are getting cases, we're not getting consequences because people have either already met the virus and have immunity via that route, or more than likely they've been vaccinated because we have a really high vaccine uptake rate, particularly in our most vulnerable population. And although that's not preventing infection, what it is doing is giving people enough of an immune foundation that they're not becoming severely unwell, thank goodness. But on the testing front, I think it's a reasonable observation that, yes, we have significantly downscaled our rates of testing. We were doing a million plus tests a day. It had one of the highest testing rates in the world in the UK. Many of those facilities have now been mothballed, decommissioned or reversed, gone back to what they were doing before. And this means that where previously, when we got a positive, we were using the sample and the extracted um, nucleic acid, the genetic material, and we were reading that and generating the genetic code of the virus to tell us what it was. Now we are doing much fewer testing or much lower levels of testing so we don't have the same resolution, the same sort of scale of radar screen that we did have and that we were feeding to the world actually and so there is some degree of blunting right. of, our, of our agility. So Chris, you say there is an uptick in cases but the severity of illness is low, would it be fair to assume then that the current crop of vaccines uh, is doing its job even with the variants? Absolutely and the vaccines that have been deployed by our Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation or JCVI, they draw up the protocol for who we're vaccinating against what and when. They are currently uh, advising that people use either the updated RNA vaccines made by Pfizer or Moderna which reflect some of the newer Omicron variants or 
the existing original so-called wild type strain of COVID that came out of Wuhan in 2020 because we don't have good evidence that you really get much of an advantage you go against these new variants from one of these newer vaccines. They both work very, very well against severe disease. Really, we, we can't fend off infection for very long with these vaccines. You get protected for a while. Most of the heavy lifting is in the form of people not becoming severely unwell right. and not going into hospital. Thankfully, our number of people who are on ventilators is a fraction of the number that it was compared with when we had similar numbers of cases. We've currently got, we think, about a 2% prevalence in the country. One person in every 50 walking the streets of London at the moment is yeah. a case of coronavirus. We are not seeing that translating into hospitalisation at anything like the rate we did. Roger Schwalt, uh, in an interview with the United States Television Network, uh, President Biden said the pandemic is over, but there still needs... Uh, there's still a lot to be done. Uh, and we're looking at some figures from the CDC, that's the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. About 400 people a day are dying from COVID-19, Roger. Did the president muddle the message and have we dropped our guard a little bit too soon? Yeah, well, a pandemic has a very specific uh, definition. And uh, in that sense, maybe the worst portion of this is over. You know, if you look back at the 1918-1919 uh, influenza pandemic, you can see some similarities. There was a situation where it went around the world a number of times, a number of waves. And what we have today is a seasonal influenza epidemic that happens every year in the wintertime. And I think that's very similar to what we're going to. There was a transition period in the 1918, 1920s uh, to that sort of a pattern. And I think what we're, what we're seeing now is a transition over to that period where we might not see waves in the middle of the summertime, but we may see an uptick like we do with influenza in the wintertime. It's still a major health issue, and Roger, but it what do you may make... not be to right. pandemic proportions. Uh, Roger, what do you make of this number that we're getting from the CDC, 400 people dying each day? Yeah, that's, um, that, that, that's obviously 400 people too many. Um, but uh, if you look in, during the middle of a uh, influenza season, you'll see numbers similar to that. I, I also echo what Chris has said. Uh, I work in the intensive care unit. I work in the ICU and I see patients every day like this. We are nowhere near what we saw in late 2020, early 2021 in terms of the just the mass number of humanity that were in and pushed into intensive care units and the, and the struggle that we as healthcare providers needed to do to treat those patients. We occasionally see a, a influenza patient and a COVID-19 patient, but not nearly to that degree. And I think really it has to do with the T cells ability to, um, to cope and to mutate with these uh, right. Omicron variants that we're seeing right now. Uh, look, Patel, uh, looking at another number from the CDC, uh, um, the census tells us that only 31% of children ages 5 to 11 have been vaccinated. And we know that there's been a lot of confusion, there's been a lot of misinformation about vaccinations. In fact, here in the United States, it also became very politicized. Uh, what are you seeing and what are parents telling you? Anand, I'm seeing exactly what you've just described. As parents out there all unifying in the fact that they want to do the best they can to protect their children, but they've heard mixed messaging, not only about the vaccine's effectiveness, but about whether or not the children actually need the vaccine if COVID is actually causing severe illness, either acutely or long-term in kids. Then there's also a whole sea of misinformation out there about potential dangers of the vaccine, such as the vaccine affecting puberty or growth in some fashion or altering DNA, which we know none of that is true. And I think what this does show us is that we really stumbled when it came to quick a quick scientific communication, but also being able to put out information fast enough to combat misinformation. That number you cited of 30% of kids age 5 to 11 actually being fully vaccinated, that number is even lower for kids below 5. And the one thing that I will tell everyone out there, both as a journalist and still as a pediatric hospitalist, someone who sees kids every day hospitalized, not only with COVID-19, but with a whole sea of diseases, is that children should not be pushed aside and saying just because children are not elderly or don't have serious chronic underlying conditions, they cannot get sick. And that was a narrative that was pushed forward against vaccine hesitant populations for the past year and a half, two years. And so any parents out there listening, if your kids are not vaccinated, please do so. Get them their COVID-19 vaccine. Also get them their flu shot. I'm gonna plug that as well because we're heading into cold and flu season. That stumble that you talked about, Alok, uh, you know, when this became very politicized and there was a lot of misinformation around, um, what's being done to counter that? 
I think one of the most important things being done to it, done to counter that, is acknowledging it, first of all. We saw CDC Director Walensky put out the, re the results of her finding and saying that the CDC and other national public health entities were not putting out information quick enough. We saw preprint studies get headlines in a way they never have before in the history of scientific publication. There has to be a new method moving forward to actually come forward and say, right. this is not true, this is true. We gotta get information out there faster. And one thing that's really important is to make sure that we're speaking to people in terms they understand. This is where community leaders are so important. Yeah. And we need to make sure that as public health and scientific communicators, we're not assuming that everyone out there is watching television, reading scientific journals, has social media, uh -huh. or knows exactly where to find the right information at the right time. We need to meet them where they are. Chris, if we look at the situation in the United Kingdom, 166,000 people in the UK have died from COVID-19. And there was, there's a public inquiry that opened uh, this week in Britain with a promise to get to the truth um, and to expose any wrongdoing. What are your expectations from um, that inquiry? And what do you think might change? What I hope will change is that we'll invest better in infection control measures because I've been banging my head against the wall for many years actually because every season flu comes and as we've already said at the top of this program we have seasonal outbreaks of flu it's predictable almost like a clock almost like the tide we know it's coming so why are we not doing more to do better infection control against that and then we'll be in a better position when things like COVID come along I think what the inquiry will reveal is that we listened to what was happening in other countries, we looked at their experience, we thought that probably that would happen in our own country, we anticipated massive overload of our hospitals with younger people who would need intensive care facilities, we emptied hospitals very, very rapidly, largely of elderly people, and we put them into care homes. Many of them were discharged to care homes infected with coronavirus and there was no capacity and no facility to do proper testing, proper screening and then proper quarantining of those cases. The result was massive outbreaks in care homes and huge loss of life because that was exactly where the most vulnerable people were. I think that is what the inquiry will find. That's what they'll conclude. And one has to accept that in a pandemic emergency situation, no one has any answers. Yeah. It's only speculation and therefore this is not and must not be about finger pointing. Mm -hmm. This should be about constructive learning and how we do and practice medicine and public health better in the future. Roger, in the United States, um, the, United, the country rolled out COVID-19 boosters that was back in September. But according to a report from the Kaiser Family Foundation, nearly half of Americans do not plan to get this uh, updated booster. Why is there still so much hesitancy about vaccines here in the U.S.? Well, it's a number of things. Number one, it's the risk-benefit ratio. A lot of people see that deaths are down, and um, they're saying, what's, what's the risk? What's the benefit ratio? When we look back two years ago, uh, a, a disease that was putting p patients into the hospital and overcrowding hospitals versus now, where we're not seeing that, they're weighing that risk-benefit ratio, and it's, it's not as good as it used to be in terms of benefit to risk in their mind. There's also a huge trust issue as well. I mean, there's been a number of studies that have shown in just surveys that the trust factor of the public health departments, uh, not just in the United States, but globally in Western countries, uh, to medical doctors, medical uh, personnel has gone way down as a result of this pandemic. And um, I, I think one of the things... If, if you look, and Chris just mentioned this, you know, every year we get uh, the flu coming like clockwork. And, you know, people have looked into this. We also noticed the same thing with COVID-19. There was a study that was published in, in Nature um, by Walrand that looked at why was it that we saw these peaks that were happening right now in Europe two years ago, and they're happening again. Why is it happening during the winter season? They, and they found that there was no connection to humidity. There was no connection to temperature. What the connection was, was to latitude. And there's some very good um, retrospective data that seems to connect sunlight exposure um, to COVID-19 mortality. We're talking fresh air, sunshine, things that actually can impact your, your lifestyle. And what I, a lot of what I have heard is that uh, the public health departments are not really putting that forward. They're not talking about nutrition, diet, exercise. And that's leading a lot of people to think that all of these recommendations from 
from the public health departments uh, are, are pharmaceutically motivated. So I think one of the things to regain trust would be to start talking about some of these lifestyle things that would resonate with a lot of these people. Alok Patel, uh, October, of course, marks the start of the flu season. And we have seen mild flu seasons over the past few years since the pandemic started. But uh, right now, the CDC is reporting that there are high levels of influenza in Texas, Georgia, uh, and Washington. Um, could we see a higher number of cases this year? And I mean, what about young children? We absolutely could. And we saw this we saw this headline about a month ago describing what Australia was seeing. And usually, as Roger just pointed out, latitude does kind of coincide with our with when we see the flu in the southern hemisphere is going to see it before we do. We use that as a prediction. Australia saw some of the highest numbers they've seen in years. Now, naturally, our last couple of years were blunted because of masks and people staying home, but we're already seeing influenza earlier in the pediatric population. And what people should really understand is unlike COVID-19, influenza, RSV, some of these other viruses that can cause a common cold in an adult or a young, healthy adolescent can be devastating for young babies. And we see children, unfortunately, die every single year from things like RSV and influenza. So that is something we're also worried about. And one other asterisk about our healthcare system, our healthcare system is overrun right now. And it not, doesn't necessarily have to do with COVID-19. We have a shortage. And I, I think both of my colleagues on this panel would agree with me that that is something we have to address because a bad influenza season can overload our hospitals on its own without any other virus in place. And that's something that we're all worried about. Chris, very quickly, I've only got about a minute, well, half a minute left, really. Do we know at this point what the future of COVID-19 looks like? Uh, the future, just as Niels Bohr said about quantum mechanics, is very hard to predict. <laughs> but the bottom line is that we know that, as one commentator put it, the coronavirus has only played a fraction of its genetic hand so far. It will come up with new variants. Whether or not, though, it's played its trump card yet in the hands it has played, is yet to be seen, but it's almost inevitable. We will see more variants, more of the same, although we're much better equipped now to deal with it. So we are dealing with a different disease than we were two years ago. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, DC. Thank you for watching. of business is to bring value.